Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Philip Strader. I'm a project scientist with the Research Triangle Nanotechnology Network and I manage the Nano Endeavor Lab at the Analytical Instrumentation Facility or AIF at NC State. In this video I will be giving you an introduction to the nano indentation technique. So a little bit about AIF. The AIF is NC State's primary shared research facility for materials characterization. We have over 20 major pieces of instrumentation, including all kinds of scanning and transmission electron microscopes, surface science and spectroscopy instruments, as well as X-ray diffractometry or X-ray chromatography instruments. The actual nano indenters we have are unique in our facility, given that they are our only physical characterization tools. We actually have two operational nano indentation instruments one being considered a tribal indenter, meaning in addition to the vertical force measurement, which is a one-dimensional test, it also has a two-dimensional transducer, which can measure lateral force. And with a lot of other things, it can do many other modes. So it's a more broadly used tribological tool. So in today's presentation, I'll first introduce the nano indentation method and some specifics regarding our system. After that, I'll go over how things like elastic modulus and hardness can be determined through nano indentation, as well as going into the theory and contact mechanics models that are used to do so. And I'll wrap up by pointing out some factors to consider in nano indentation experiments, as well as some variations from ideality and other mechanical measurements that you might be able to do. So to give you some context about how I've approached giving this presentation, as a lab manager for the nano indenter, I find often that and most often that newer perspective users tend to underthink their approach to nano indentation. Uh, it seems pretty simple. Poke this material and tell me the hardness and modulus. It reminds me of these commercials that you can see from Rocket Mortgage, which they claim to have greatly simplified the process for getting a mortgage and their catchphrase is push button, get mortgage. So I'm always reminded of that. I imagine people saying push button, get data when they step up to the instrument. So can you really just push a button and get data? Well, there is a button that you push to get your data, but you really need to know what's going on when you do push the button. And that's what I'll be going into in this presentation. So why is nano indentation even used? Well, it's primarily used to measure mechanical properties, especially where the actual amount or volume of a sample or its features are small, like thin films, bones and teeth, nanostructures, among other things. Most commonly, the properties measured through nano indentation are elastic modulus and hardness. However, the technique can be used to extract other information like viscoelastic properties, induced failures like fracturing, and more creative uses as time goes on. Before getting too into this topic, it's really critical to understand the scale that we're working at. If you were to walk into what I would consider a dedicated physical testing lab, you would mostly find large machines, kind of like this three-point bend test or Instron machines where very large samples are placed in, they're broken, and you have to replace that large sample to test more. Those are what we would consider macro scale physical testing. Nano indentation is part of a category of physical testing techniques called instrumented indentation. And in all of those, you have a rigid probe with known properties being forced into a material with unknown properties. Within this category, the differences come down further to scale, where a traditional hardness tester, where you may have heard of Noop, Rockwell, or Vickers hardness testers, as shown here, that's a Vickers indent, those would be considered micro indentation, where it's a micro scale test, given that the indent sizes are on the order of hundreds of microns. If you are trying to understand the physical properties and the scale of the features or the sample volume is smaller than the macro or the micro scale, you didn't have a lot of options up until a few decades ago when nano indentation came along and it became possible to interrogate physical properties at the nano scale, where the contact area is on the order of hundreds to thousands of nanometers. And this comparison and scale can really be seen here where a spherical micro indenter size is being compared with a Berkovich uh, nano indenter tip right here. So if you need to interrogate anything on the order of thousands of nanometers or less, uh, you pretty much are limited to nano indentation. Otherwise, you're going to get influence from 
the micro or even macro scale. Here's a specific application of nano annotation to give you an idea of how it can be used and applied. It's also pretty relevant given the current COVID-19 pandemic. In hospitals or healthcare arenas, there are all kinds of different disinfectant wipes used. In your own home, you've probably used a Lysol wipe or a wet wipe. But imagine that instead of a household disinfectant, the formulation is designed to be able to kill tuberculosis or some other specific viral agent. In hospitals, pretty much any surface or object that can be touched has to be disinfected. Some disinfectant chemistries can cause more damage to certain materials more than others, particularly clear plastics like isolates or screen covers, things that might be made of acrylic, tend to be more easily damaged by chemical and mechanical attack. In this particular study, we took coupon-sized samples of common materials found in healthcare and then soaked them up to a dotted line and different disinfectants. So disinfectant was uh, soaked up into this line in a jar. Then we used nano notation to measure the hardness and modulus before and after exposure to that chemical. What we noticed was the virgin acrylic and the acrylic soaked and disinfectant A and B did not have a significant change in properties, meaning their hardness and modulus were not significantly different. And when we overlapped the force displacement curves, there wasn't much of a difference. However, what quickly became obvious was that disinfectant C had some impact. The modulus and the hardness had changed. And then even if you only look at the displacement curves, it's easy to see that every sample soaked in disinfectancy could not resist deformation as well. So nano indentation is advantageous in a study like this for a few reasons, but mainly first, the study was limited to small size samples. Uh, the samples couldn't fit in a standard Instron tensile tester where you can only put one sample in and it would be destroyed. Nano indentation is able to get many tests off of one sample and it helps you get good statistics. Secondly, nano indentation is highly surface sensitive, meaning this change could be mostly limited to the surface of the material and not a bulk change. So with a study like this, disinfecting chemistries can be tailored so that they do not damage certain materials or objects, or perhaps a warning can be placed on the label to discourage its use on certain materials. During nano indentation, the vertical displacement of a probe is measured during controlled loading and unloading phases. Typically, there is also some period of holding the tip in place at max load or of max depth for some time, which we call a dwell period. No matter what you set out to measure from a nano indentation experiment, the actual output is not a direct measurement of modulus or hardness. The output is simply what you see here which is a force displacement curve. So a plot of the force and displacement measured during that loading, dwelling, and unloading phase. Now, from this force displacement curve, properties of the material like modules and hardness can be measured. There's quite a few different types of tips or probes available. And depending on the specific nano indenter brand or model, they may have a different variety available. Uh, these tips are commonly made of diamond and the cost for each tip is on the order of thousands of dollars. For this reason, tips should be taken care of so they can be used for a long time. This particular slide shows specifics of tips available in AIF and their usual applications. Uh, the most commonly used is what's called a Berkovich tip, which has a three-sided pyramidal geometry. This geometry is easy to form into a single sharp point and it's usually a good multi-purpose tip and can be used on almost any sample. A cube corner tip is similar to the Berkovich given that it is a three-sided pyramid, but instead it's formed with perpendicular faces like the corner of a cube. And basically it's the Berkovich tip with just a higher aspect ratio, which can cause more deformation at less load and it has higher resolution to be able to interrogate very, very small features due to that. For softer materials like polymers, uh, generally you have to go to larger radius tips and less sharp tips for a few reasons that I might discuss later. Uh, and so you would use a conospherical tip in that case. Now let's talk about how force is actually applied and how displacement is measured, at least in our instrument. 
The probe is installed into the floating metal plate of a three plate capacitive transducer. Through the top plate and the bottom plate are an alternating current 180 degrees or perfectly out of phase of each other. By applying a direct current offset to the bottom plate, an electrostatic force actuation pulls this middle plate down, thus applying force to the tip and then to the sample. An electric signal constantly measured out of the system based on the position of the floating middle plate, called the tear output value or TOV, corresponds to the displacement of the floating metal plate, and thus displacement during indentation can be monitored. Here are a lot of specifics about our instrument, which is the Bruker Heizotron TI-980 Tribo indenter that you can see here. Uh, the maximum limits of force and displacement for the standard transducer for nano indentation, meaning the vertical test, is up to 10 millinewtons, with a maximum displacement of five microns. We also have a two-dimensional transducer on this system which can do scratch testing with the maximum lateral force being around two millinewtons, the maximum indentation depth during the scratch being around 500 nanometers, and then the maximum lateral displacement, or rather the longest scratch possible is about 15 microns. On each transducer, the probe can also function as a contact mode scan probe microscope or SPM, there are piezo actuators which can scan the probe at a low force around two micronewtons along the surface in an area, rastering, and measuring the displacement of the probe constantly. From that, it can give you a spatial representation and, and three-dimensional values. So basically you get a topographical map of the area that was scanned. This SPM method is important for many users as it can help get an approximate value of roughness before indenting. It can also aid in selecting very specific areas for testing, and it can also help by imaging the residual indent to confirm or even quantify its quality. The system is also equipped with a pretty good optical microscope, which is mostly used to navigate the sample and select large areas, like you can see here. Uh, and in this case, uh, you can see the indents. Now, it's not common that indents can be seen optically as seen here, but for very soft materials, the indents can be visible, like for polycarbonate. These are the main testing modes available on our Bruker TI-980. Quasi-static nanoindentation is what most people refer to as just nanoindentation. We can also oscillate the probe during nanoindentation for dynamic mechanical analyses, which they call nano-DMA. There's another mode called accelerated property mapping, which is basically a rapid fire nanoindentation experiment. While quasi-static nanoindentation is generally on timescales of many seconds up to minutes, the XPM mode does hundreds of indents in a matter of seconds over a large area, which yields a lot of data over a pretty large area. And this data can be used to kind of make a heat map of relative modulus and hardness values in an area like you can see here. So you can tell it to set up hundreds of indents in a 60 micron square area, and then assign a color map based on low hardness to high hardness. So in this case, uh, the yellow and orange colors would be lower modulus and then, or lower hardness, and then blue would be higher hardness. So you can get an idea of spatially how your physical properties uh, are dependent. I've already mentioned the SPM function, but I do wanna point out that the SPM mode can also be used as what's called a nanoware testing mode, where the probe is forced into the material to a higher set point force and then rastered in an area for a set number of passes that you can program. So you can set up different areas to wear for different forces and passes and then use the same SPM function to then remeasure the surface and then see what the effect of wear on the sample is. There is also a nano scratch mode on the 2D transducer as I've mentioned which can be used to determine properties like coefficient of friction or adhesion property of a film to a substrate if you can induce failures like delamination. For this video, I will only be going over the quasi-static nanonotation mode. With that said, 
please don't hesitate to contact me directly if you have any questions or interest in these other testing modes. If you're not familiar with physical testing, it's important to recall the different types of deformation, specifically how it relates to measuring force as a function of displacement. Elastic deformation occurs when the displacement of a material is totally recovered after force is applied, meaning the loading curve and the unloading curve would essentially perfectly overlap, like here. If the material remains permanently deformed after a load is applied, it's called plastic deformation, meaning you would have a loading phase and then a straight down drop for the unloading phase. In nano indentation, we're hoping to cause something in the middle of the two called either an elastoplastic or inelastic deformation, where there is both permanent and recoverable deformation. Two researchers, Oliver and Farr, applied knowledge of contact mechanics and applied it to nano indentation to be able to calculate properties like modulus and hardness in nano indentation from its unloading curve. There are some nano indentation techniques that will measure hardness or modulus from the loading curve, but for this specific system and the things that I'm talking about in this presentation, we're talking about the Oliver Farr method. Before I go into how modulus and hardness can be calculated from an unloading curve, I need to introduce some very important terms. Let's consider one side or profile of a Berkovich indenter tip approaching a flat surface, indenting it, and then being removed. So instead of thinking of the whole three-sided pyramid, think of just one side of that pyramid, a triangle. The initial surface of the sample before the tip approaches is indicated by this red line here. Once the indenter is forced into the material to a maximum load or depth, the surface displaces as a result. The indenter's profile being shown here as the blue line. The maximum depth that the tip reaches from the initial sample surface is considered the penetration depth, which is abbreviated as H or H max. So that would simply be the initial surface being your zero and then wherever the tip reaches being your maximum depth. However, the surface of the sample does not necessarily follow the exact profile of the indenter shape, meaning it's not going to perfectly reflect this triangle going in. What you can get at the perimeter of the indent is what's called sink-in. So instead of the material deforming just as a result of the indenter being there, the surface will sink in a bit. So you still have a somewhat flat surface with no shape, but it's sunk down a little bit. We call that sink-in, and, and it is abbreviated as HS, so we call that the surface displacement at perimeter of contact. What is important in the calculation of modulus and hardness coming up is what's called the contact depth, meaning the actual depth at which there is contact with the indenter tip during the indent, so meaning it's not necessarily the H max, but it's the contact depth that accounts for sink in with the max depth. So if this contact depth corrected by sink in is important, how do we do it? Luckily, the Oliver Farr method does this automatically. Now to recap, the max depth H or H max is how much the initial surface was totally displaced by the nano indenter from its original surface. The contact depth is the vertical displacement over which actual contact is being made between the sample and the, and the tip at the max depth. We can account for sink in to calculate the contact depth by doing this. So first, we need to calculate the stiffness of the material. Stiffness, S, is simply the slope fit of the unloading curve at max load. Contact depth is then calculated as follows. HC, your contact depth, is equal to the max depth minus the max force times epsilon, which is some geometric constant depending on the uh, indenter shape that you have installed, divided by the stiffness. So knowing the max force a shape constant for the indenter shape that we're using, the max force and the stiffness at max force, we can account for sink in. So now that we know these important terms, we can go over how modulus and hardness is calculated in nano indentation. To be clear, 
The modulus measured in nano annotation is specifically called reduced modulus, abbreviated as ER. The relationship between reduced modulus and a known modulus and Poisson ratio of an indenter, in our case diamond, and the unknown modulus and unknown Poisson ratio of a sample is shown via this expression. But in the actual nano annotation experiment, we can calculate modulus and hardness based on stiffness and contact area at the max force. So reduced modulus would simply be half the square root of pi times the measured stiffness value divided by the square root of the projected contact area. And then the hardness is simply equal to the max force during the experiment divided by the projected area contact area. This projected contact area, which is plugged into the formula which calculates the modulus and hardness in nano notation, is not directly measured any time you indent a sample. This relationship, called the tip area function, must be determined in advance. And the way you do that is with that tip, you indent into a sample of known modulus, we like fused quartz, and indent to multiple depths to determine the function of contact depth to contact area. So for a conical tip, right, if you indent to a depth of H1, a different amount of area will be in contact than at H2, H3, and so on. So you indent multiple times, and then the contact depth and contact area is plotted. So by calculating the projected area as a function of contact depth to known samples, we can then apply that to unknown samples and determine modulus and hardness. On this slide, I show you what the data analysis software looks like after you've loaded a force displacement curve from an annotation experiment in. So we have our force displacement curve. We have some options for adjusting offsets or changing some other things, but in general, most of this is automatic. This execute fit button is that all powerful button that I mentioned earlier in the presentation. When you click execute fit, it automatically pulls a stored tip area function. It calculates the maximum force. It detects the unloading curve, measures the slope of it, and does, and then it calculates the projected area after it's calculated the contact depth. And then of course, with all that information, it gives you the modulus and hardness here at the top. That wraps up all of the background theory I have for this presentation. Now I wanna go over some factors that should be considered in nano indentation, particularly things that are not automatically accounted for by the software or theory, and it's ultimately up to the user to prevent, limit, or account these effects. First and foremost is sample preparation or sample prep. Like almost any analytical techniques, you set yourself up for success and failure by just how you prepare your sample. Generally speaking, you need your sample to be as flat, smooth, and secure as possible for an indentation. You can imagine at this scale, vibration can be a huge effect. If you're using the SPM mode, the sample can move around and give you noise and measurement. We need to have the sample as secure as possible. I always recommend super gluing the sample to these little magnetic AFM disks or pucks. To give you an idea of scale, those are about the size of a US quarter. They can be attached then to these little magnet regions on the stage, or it can be placed where you see these suction rings. And those suction rings can also be used for holding down very smooth samples like a glass slide or cleaved sections of a silicon wafer. And in fact, if you have a four inch wafer, it could technically put, be put directly on the stage by suction with this outer ring. If you have flexible or odd shaped samples like bone or fiber samples, you typically need to embed that in some resin or epoxy and then polish the surface down as shown here. PMMA is a good example and commonly used for fixing bone samples. And then of course, you can then uh, super glue that to one of these pucks. Now, obviously super gluing the sample down could mean and most likely means you will not get the sample back for other testing. 
many people have experimented with other resins and using double-sided tape, but you need to be very careful in what you use to adhere the sample since you could be introducing a spring into your system. Sample roughness is also a critical factor that can affect modulus and hardness values measured in nano indentation. If you have a very rough sample and aren't indenting deep enough, the projected contact area will not be accurate. Thus, the calculation of modulus and hardness will probably both be wrong. Ideally, you should calculate the roughness and then indent so deep such that the effect of roughness is minimized, meaning the roughness value is less than 5% of the indentation depth. So if you have a five nanometer RA roughness, you need to indent at least 100 nanometers to negate the effect of roughness. It is technically possible to account for roughness using analytical models as shown here, but in my opinion, it's always better to minimize roughness up front through polishing or indenting as deep as you can such that it isn't a problem. If your samples are thin films on a substrate, you need to consider the film's thickness. The actual stress fields in a sample are much larger than the measured indentation depth. Even if you're not indenting deep enough to totally blow through the film and reach the substrate, the effects of that substrate can begin to dominate the measured properties of the film. So even though you would indent this deep, that substrate has an influence on that it could impact physical properties of the film up here. As a general rule of thumb, it's best to indent to depth less than 10% of the film thickness or even less for soft material. So if you have a 500 nanometer film, indent no more than 100 nanometers so that you can avoid stress fields and substrate effect. To give you an idea, here's some data from a study showing just how dramatic film thickness and substrate effects can impact data. In this study, a half micron thick aluminum film was deposited on four different substrates of increasing hardness, an aluminum substrate, glass substrate, a silicon substrate, and then a sapphire substrate. On the left, we have hardness measured as a function of depth, and then on the right graph, we have a Young's modulus measured as a function of depth. Now, please note that the indentation axis is normalized for indentation depth as a function of film thickness. So one to one would mean half micron indentation depth to half micron film thickness. So these red lines show you where we've gone through the film. So for the aluminum in the glass, you, on either side, you don't see, or you at least see a similar trend in data. And on the hardness, for the, especially for the sapphire, you can start to see the hardness start to creep up as we get closer to the boundary between the thickness and, or the film and the substrate. This effect is even more dramatic on the Young's modulus. When we look at the silicon, even well before we're close to the boundary of the film and the substrate, we start to see a trend in the modulus data. Just as well, for the sapphire, which is even harder, you see a dramatic trend and effect of that substrate even before you get too deep into the material. So if you have control over your film deposition process, you can avoid this effect by making thicker films just for your nano indentation samples, or if you know the general modulus, try to deposit the film on a material with similar physical properties. If you can't change the sample, again, make sure you're making relatively shallow indents and test multiple depths to show you did the due diligence to check for substrate effect. So we've talked about indenting too deep. You also have to consider you may not be indenting deep enough. For very shallow indents, you may have a higher measured hardness value due to a higher concentration of geometrically necessary dislocation loops. So usually as your dislocation concentration goes up, your yield strength goes up and your hardness measured will go up. As you can see in this example, the measured hardness of an aluminum nitride film is higher at the surface then gets lower as indentation depth increases. I've said it multiple times, but always, it's always good practice to indent at multiple depths to confirm consistency. This next factor is mostly a concern for very soft materials. I'm talking about materials well under one gigapascal modulus and hardness. The way the tip actually finds the surface before indenting it is that it slowly approaches the surface and then stops when a two micronewton set point force is detected. 
For some samples, this two micronewton force is enough to cause an indent or deformation like sink in before the indent actually happens. If you have any deformation before you actually do the indent, that's all going to affect your data. So if to confirm this happens, you would set up a two micronewton uh, indent or just image the surface after it's been approached and see if there was any deformation. And if you can confirm it's happening, then there you have a few different solutions that you can do. You can decrease the set point to about one micronewton. It's, uh, it can't get much lower than that. You can also start the indent above the surface, but most often the best solution is to program a lift up in the load function. So bring the tip up just above the surface before doing the indent. In my opinion, this lift up is good practice to do in any case, and I almost always program a lift up in my load functions. All of the assumptions and models that go into measuring hardness and modulus in nano indentation assume that there's only deformation under the tip, meaning only vertical displacement like sink in or deformation due to the indent. In some cases, material can be deformed around the tip and pile up at the indenter perimeter. So you remember when we have sink in, the material kind of deforms, flexes down to the indenter tip. But when you have pile up, you get material kind of being pushed outwards, accumulating at the perimeter of the tip, and it can create forces that are pushing back on the tip artificially. And to really see what this pileup looks like, this is an SEM image where of a Berkovich indent where you don't have very clean lines and you can see the material piling up. Now, if pileup happens, this can read as higher hardness values. And more importantly, the Oliver Farr interpretation does not account for pileup. So the only way to confirm if you have pileup is, well, you can suspect it if you're seeing higher hardness values than you would expect, or you can remeasure the surface or re-image the surface after indentation and confirm if there is pileup using the SPM function or an SEM. Tip rounding and tip wear is also something you should monitor. Even though these tips are made of diamond, stress and abuse over time can change the shape of the indenter tip. Small changes in tip shape can affect the tip area function, but can usually be corrected by just doing a new tip area function calibration. In practice, you should always test the material with null modulus and hardness to confirm the condition of the tip, thus confirming the accuracy of the stored tip and you should be testing that standard sample before and after your experiments. If you ever see a change in the hardness and modulus of that sample, it could be a sign of tip wear, and then you may need to look at that in an SEM to confirm it's that, if that's there. Again, you can correct this through a tip area function if it's small changes, if, if it's a small change, but if it's a very dramatic change and the tip is ruined, it may be time to retire that tip. But like I said, they're expensive, so try to make them last as long as possible. Another factor to consider is creep, viscoelastic effects, and any other type of time-dependent deformation. You can tell the presence of creep in a nanonotation test if instead of seeing a nice inelastic deformation like this black uh, force displacement curve here, you instead see that you apply the load and then even at the max load, you continue getting deformation or the force can drop while it's maintaining it at the same one and you get this bowing effect and that's the telltale sign of creeper time dependent effects. If you see that and press the button to get your data and click execute fit, the curve fitting would either give an error because it's trying to measure if uh, a curve fit here or it will just give you an incorrect value. There's not much we can do to avoid creep effects during sample prep or in the first place, but there are some potential solutions you can try in setting up the loading conditions. First, you wanna try and quantify these behaviors. You can do so by indenting at different rates or monitoring the deformation under constant load, meaning ramp up to a maximum load, hold that max load for a long time, and then see how long it takes for the creep effect to catch up or stop. That displacement over time will give you the creep rate. Once you know that, you can set the unloading rates to be at least 10 times the measured creep rate. You can also increase the dwell time to give the material time to stabilize before unloading. 
basically, if you notice time dependence in your data, you're going to need to make your tests longer. To give you an idea of this, in extreme cases like uh, aluminum, I've had to program dwell times of three minutes. When reviewing these forced displacement curves, you want to look for any anomalies or inconsistencies. For instance, you might see these pop-in events where there's a big change in indentation depth, but no subsequent change in force. These discrete yield events can be caused by all kinds of things that will not be obvious right away, but include dislocation nucleation, crack formation or fracture, or even rupture, strain transfer against across green boundaries, or even phase transformation, which we also call pop-out. These pop-in events are not accounted for in the modulus and hardness calculation. When it does the curve fit, it's only looking at the unloading curve. It's assuming you had a nice clean loading period. Thus, you would not want to report any of the values of modulus and hardness without also noting the presence of the pop-ins. Now, even though these can undermine your roughness and modulus measurements, there are some researchers who intentionally try to cause these pop-in events so they can learn more about grain properties of the material or strength of fracture and other things. If you observe a pop-in event, the only way to confirm it was a result of fracture is by imaging the subsequent indent and seeing if there are cracks extending from the indent, like you see here. So you have the Berkovich indenter uh, deformation, and then you have cracks extending from it. From those crack lengths, it's possible to get an approximation of fracture toughness by measuring it from the center and the length from the side, like shown here. Now, the SPM mode available on the instrument is probably only enough to confirm that the fracture occurred. A good quantification would require finding that exact same indent in a high resolution SEM or AFM because the SPM function may not have a high enough resolution to measure the entire crack length. Fracturing of a material during nano indentation is not common with our system since our maximum load is 10 millinewtons, but there are higher load transducers that can be purchased. Sometimes using a sharper tip like the cube corner can improve your chances of inducing fractures, but ultimately you're limited to whether you can cause fracture at the loads that are used in nano indentation. All right, and with that, that concludes my nano indentation technique introduction. As you can tell, there's quite a bit that goes into this technique and the concepts that go into the analysis can be intimidating, but can be accounted for or controlled. In any case, I hope you've learned something from this video. Thank you so much for your time. Please don't hesitate to contact me via email if you have questions or go to the AIF website to learn more about our capabilities. Thanks again.